early May of this year, Hans Winsness, who is the general manager of this hotel, invited me to come to Malaysia to do some sales training for his team and for their sister property at the Park Royale. Uh, I was also honored to be one of the speakers at the Malaysian Professional Speakers Association conference during that week. And just before our departure, Sharifa sent me a note with an envelope with several hundred ringgits worth of vouchers asking if Denise and I, Denise is my wife, and I call her Denise because that's her name, um, she asked if Denise and I would shop some of the concessions in the airport on our way out and just send her our impressions. And so we did. Our flight left uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon, so we got to the airport about 10 or 11 o'clock and checked our luggage, and we cruised around to some of the shops. We looked at some souvenirs. We looked at a camera. Uh, we looked at a number of things, and we are just you know, trying to you know, make our way through the, the land side of the airport. And Denise, suddenly, she lights up. She says, oh, look. They have, they have a body shop. Body, a body shop, body shop. She says, I love body shop. I, she gets all her stuff. Yeah, I wonder if they have body butter. She says, she loves body butter. We used to have body shop in our hometown in Boulder, Colorado, but they closed the store. She says, oh my God, we've got to go to body shop. We gotta. So we walk into body shop. She makes a beeline to the body butter. And of course, now I'm a typical husband in tow, Right? Well, I'm standing there as she's raiding the shelves, and I'm approached by this young man. His name was, I have to check my note here, because I want to get it right. His name was Shaharir. Shaharir was 20-something, dark hair, moosed, stylishly combed, well-dressed. He sidles up next to me and hands me a wicker basket lined with a cotton handkerchief. Doesn't give it to Denise, he gives it to me, because he knows who's going to be standing there. I didn't do it. What clean up on aisle three? So I'm saying, no, it's fine. It's just a, a glass fell off the stage. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, I was at the body shop. <laughs> uh, holding, you know, I'm, I'm the typical husband there holding the basket. And Denise is piling this stuff in, piling this stuff in. And this young man was extraordinary. He was opening up testers, and he's, you know, hey, if you like that fragrance, then here, try the coconut, you know. And, and he's cross selling, he's upselling, and he's showing Denise other products around the store. He was enthusiastic, he was engaging, he was excited, he was proactive, and he was enormously helpful. We fill this basket with uh, body shop products, and we make our way to the register, where he promptly puts them all into Ziploc bags, where they will, now they won't leak inside our luggage. And as he hands me my credit card, it's smoking around the edges. He explains that because these are larger than six ounce containers, they won't be able to go through security with our carry-on luggage, but he would be delighted to box them for us so we could check it with our baggage. Well, we had already checked our baggage, and we explained, well, our flight leaves, and we, it, it, there's, we, don't, ha the, we don't have time to do that. So Denise, being the problem solver, she says, well, do you have them in smaller containers? He says, oh, yes, oh, yes, we have the three-ounce size. So he, goes, he puts the six-ounce back, he gets the three-ounce. He put, gets the three-ounce, he takes that back to the step, start over, re-ring the... Tr and as he's ringing up the transaction for the second time, he realizes, wait a minute, the three-ounce are 20 ringgits or two for 35 ringgits. They're on sale. And those of you women in the room, you know that's the two magic words, right? Guys, don't you wish you had all of the money that your wife has saved you by buying things on sale? So now we get, now we, now we got two, two of everything instead of just one. Ring it all up, put it um, in Ziploc so, so now we can go through security. And 
It was, it was just a wonderful and exceptional experience. And the, the only problem with it was that, indeed, it was so exceptional because of all of the shops and galleries and restaurants and bookstores that we visited in the course of that three hours that morning. He was the only person who exhibited that extreme level of sales behavior. He was amazing. So that's what we're going to talk today about today. How do you become that? How do you make your salespeople and your retail operation create that kind of magical experience for the customer? Now, if you're going to be texting, and I know you're going to be because some of you are out there already going, oh, yeah, this guy really is not so good. I don't know. I'll see me later at the bar. Yeah, we'll have a drink later. Okay, BBFN, right? So if you're going to... <laughs> If you're going to be doing that, then say something nice about me. Say, I'm listening to at sign Orville Ray, that's my Twitter handle, who is teaching us about guerrilla retailing and it's fantastic or great or excellent something, right? And add this hashtag, hash M-A-H-B, so that we can go back and read those comments later. Um, we're going to talk later on this morning about the importance of social media and the role that it plays in marketing and advertising. Now, what do we mean by guerrilla? You heard in the introduction, some people think that we mean something that is aggressive or dishonest, and that really couldn't be farther from the truth. The series really started with these books, the first one written by my writing partner, Jake Conrad Levinson, called Guerrilla Marketing. It's now been translated into 47 languages. It was the first of a series of, that now counts 47 books. We've been translated into 62 languages. We just passed the 22 million books in print, Mark. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> it was followed up in 1991 with this book, Guerrilla Selling. And most of the work actually that we do is uh, speaking to sales groups about unconventional ways to improve sales. We were invited by John Wiley and Sons to write another book on guerrilla negotiating. Followed that with guerrilla teleselling, guerrilla trade show selling. And the book that we're going to feature today is guerrilla retailing. How do you create big profits from a small retail business? And I can't think of any better or more intense battleground to practice guerrilla retailing than uh, on an airport floor. Now, what do we know about airport shoppers? Well, there are several things. For one thing, we know that they're on their way to somewhere, right? Because when you get to your home airport, where do you go? Home, yeah, right. <laughs> you don't hang out, you don't die, you don't shop, you're, right? So for the most part, if you're spending time in a retail store, you're holding an outbound boarding pass to somewhere. So an important question is, when does your flight leave? That is a key piece of information for a salesperson because that tells you how much time you're going to have with that person. We also know that they have limited time. It might be 20 minutes, it might be an hour, it might be several hours, but there is some time limit for dealing with that customer. We know that more often than not, they're looking for a last minute or forgotten items. Oh gosh, I need razor blades or I need uh, a, 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 <laughs> a gift for my grandson or I need some stationery or I need a book to read on the plane, on the 14-hour flight back to Los Angeles. And we also know that generally they have a negative perception of the value that they're going to get in an airport retailer. Um, Denise and I were celebrating our anniversary. And um, actually, I had overheard this conversation at a party. She was telling a friend, she says, oh, yeah, we've had 27 uh, really great years. What well, kind of? I was thinking about it. I'm in the car driving home, I'm doing that. I say 1979. Now we did I? Because you guys, you know, the worst thing you can do is screw up this anniversary thing, right? And I said, I said, honey, wait a minute. I said that wouldn't be that would be 33 years, wouldn't it? She says, well, yeah, but five of them weren't that great. <laughs> so, so we're celebrating our 33rd wedding anniversary, and and so I asked her. I said, what would you like to do for our anniversary? She says. You know, I'd really like to go out to dinner. I said, oh, no, going out to dinner. I travel, I, I travel so much, you know. I have, 
I have done this work in 47 countries on every continent except Antarctica. I have enough frequent flyer miles to qualify for the next Mars mission. Right, so going out to a restaurant is not you know, my idea of a really good time. She says, no, no, I'd really like to, I'd like to go out. It's okay, well, where do you want to go? She says, I don't care. Take me someplace expensive. So I took her to the airport. And you may have noticed, too, that the airlines on their side of this equation, they are looking to squeeze every penny that they can. They're cutting back, cutting back, cutting back, cutting back as much as they can. Have you noticed that the service on the airlines is not what it used to be? I mean, right? I had to fly from Denver to Chicago recently. They wanted $45 to, to, uh, to check my luggage. They wanted a dollar for a cup of coffee, $2 for a Coke, $3 for a blanket. I'm sitting there thinking, what's next? I can just imagine the safety briefing. In the event of an emergency, an oxygen mask will drop from the compartment above your head, uh, place it over your nose and mouth with the elastic band, and insert a credit card, oxygen will flow to the mask. So we really have to think about how we can differentiate the retail experience for the customer. And I've been reading your mystery shopping reports. And as you already know, about half, actually 51% of the retailers at KLIA are offering a standard of customer service that's considered acceptable. 49% have been recommended for immediate remedial correction. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so how do you do that? That's the bad news. The good news is that it's simple. It's so simple, in fact, that I feel like the little boy in the parade who's saying, but, but the emperor, the, he's naked. I can't believe that I'm the only person who sees this. And what I see is that there are five things that every customer needs anytime they walk into a retail store. And if you haven't already ta started taking notes, we have a handout for you. It's in your bag if you haven't taken that out yet. They need to feel welcome. They need to feel comfortable. They need to feel important. They need to feel understood. And finally, they need to feel appreciated. 